So during the last episode of L'Atelier Balmain, we concentrated on the fascinating biography of Jeanette Spanier, the house's first directrice. Her story, besides being filled with plot lines worthy of a Hollywood film, helped to illustrate how the House of Balmain functioned during the 30 years that Spanier oversaw the daily operations at 44 Rue de Francois Premier. For today's episode, we're going to once again concentrate on roughly the same time period, but we're going to be turning our vision outward. We're going to be considering what those outside of Balmain's historic flagship knew about the house's many collections. Because during the same period that Jeanette Spanier was overseeing the retail team in the house's daily shows, Pierre Balmain's designs were key ingredients in some of the 20th century's most important fashion shootings. Month after month, season after season, his couture creations were worn by legendary models in incredible locations, captured by talented photographers, and published by the leading magazines. In today's new fashion universe, as social media allows for the most direct of communications, helping designers bypass the traditional intermediary of fashion publications, it might be hard to remember just how powerful those fashion titles used to be. To prepare for today's show, I went back through another autobiography, Pierre Beaumont's My Years and Seasons, to remind myself of what he had to say about fashion writers, magazine editors, and magazines of his time. Balmain's 1964 memoirs are a fun read. Besides offering the compelling inside story behind the founding and growth of a couture house, his book sets itself apart via a surprisingly fresh and honest tone. Throughout, Pierre Balmain shows that he's clearly someone who's not afraid to hold an opinion. He's quite upfront about how he feels about people, and he also presents his mistakes and stumbles without any attempt to deflect blame or varnish over embarrassing facts. Those of you who have been following this podcast up to now already know that Balmain very much benefited from the power of the fashion press when he first began. As we mentioned in earlier episodes, from the moment of his house's first show, Pierre Balmain had an incredible amount of positive coverage, with his house's inaugural collection given two pages of great praise in vogue, penned by Gertrude Stein and photographed by Cecil Beaton. And that was followed up by month after month of generous and always positive coverage, a six-page spread of an early collaboration with Helena Rubinstein, and then that iconic horse shooting of Gertrude Stein in Balmain, sitting in the Balmain studio and gazing up at a Balmain model who was wearing a key outfit from Balmain's first collection. And Pierre Balmain enjoyed similar amounts of praise and coverage in other fashion titles in both Europe and America. And, well, we all know, of course, that he should have been prepared for the inevitable. As anyone who works in fashion can tell you, someday he wasn't going to be so happy with his coverage. And it only took a few years for that day to arrive. In 1948, Balmain was traveling in California when he noticed that the latest issue of Vogue had photos of the new styles from Paris. But it had only included one image of a Balmain creation, and that photo was of a shoe, not a Balmain gown. Infuriated, he decided to jump on the next plane, fly to New York, and confront the editors face-to-face about that insufficient coverage. So once he arrived in Manhattan, Pierre Beaumont marched over to the Vogue offices to meet with Edna Chase, the editor-in-chief, and Bettina Ballard, the fashion editor. And as Beaumont writes, Waving my copy of the magazine, I told them, without any attempt at diplomacy, exactly what I thought. Certainly, I was lacking consideration for Mrs. Chase's age and position, as well as for the kindness that she had always shown to me. But the fact that I had always regarded Vogue as my Bible made me feel the affront so much more. And it'll probably come as no surprise to learn that the confrontation did not work out as well as Balmain might have hoped it would. He later adds, I'm afraid that day was a turning point in my relations with that magazine. Our association was never the same again and Bettina Ballard died many years later without our being reconciled. Balmain may have regretted that moment of hot-headed confrontation, but that didn't stop him from attacking another all-powerful editor a few years later. That's when he famously lost his temper with the powerful Carmel Snow. She was the editor-in-chief of the American edition of Harper's Bazaar. When Snow informed Balmain that she did not plan to come to the house's presentation and instead would come to see the collections later in the showroom privately, impetuously, Pierre Balmain decided to let her know that she would be barred from his showroom as a punishment. 
And there's plenty of other stories about the designer picking plenty of other fights with French editors and journalists as well. Balmain's memoirs also tell the story of how he thumbed his nose at the editors of an unnamed and powerful American fashion trade publication, which he describes as being the Bible of 7th Avenue, which would make you assume that he's talking about women's wear daily. Bauman writes that he decided he'd rather risk that powerful publication's retribution than renew contacts with the representatives after some other slight or snub had enraged him. But in spite of all these repeated moments when he let his emotions get the better of him, in spite of all these bridges that he seemed oh so willing to burn over the years, Bauman still managed to get some great coverage from those and other leading fashion publications. So knowing just how poorly Pierre Balmain was handling his relationships with the powerful editors, the powerful women and men who were deciding which designers they were going to shoot, it's even more impressive to see the many beautiful magazine editorial images and covers of Balmain designs that the magazines kept shooting and printing. Hello, I'm John Gilligan. For today's L'Etelier Balmain podcast, we'll be exploring, with the help of two expert guests, the history and the people behind some of this house's most iconic 20th century fashion images. I am Olivier Roustin. Welcome to my world. Welcome to my world. Bienvenue à L'Etelier Balmain. Bienvenue à L'Etelier Balmain. So as I just mentioned, for today's podcast, we'll be turning to two experts who will teach us exactly what we need to know about legendary mid-century photographers, models, and images. I'm sure everyone remembers Susanna Brown. She's the fashion photography expert and museum curator who previously walked us through the history of Horst and that renowned photographer's ties to Balmain. For this episode, Susanna called in from her London office to help introduce us to some other great talents who were working at the same time as Horst. She'll be explaining what makes the images of great artists like Avedon, Penn, Klein, and others so very compelling. And she'll also help us see what an exciting era this was for publishing, fashion, and photography, as post-war peace and prosperity combined with advancements in travel and technology to allow for a whole new type of fashion editorial shooting. And Lynn Yeager, our favorite fashion journalist, also returns for this episode giving us the inside story on many of those same shootings, photographers, and models. And I decided that the best way to do the show was to just sit back and let those experts take control. But in order to do that, we had to figure out a way to work around the difficulties of scheduling three different calendars, as well as the time differences between Paris, London, and New York. So do you remember a classic children's party game that in the States we used to call Telephone? Basically, that game is based on messages being whispered between one player and another, and then the whispering continues between others, as all the kids attempt to work together to pass the message down the line. Well, as we taped this podcast, it did sometimes feel like we were trying to play a new version of that game. We'd start out in the morning, with Susanna calling to us here in Paris from her office in London, in order to speak about one key 20th century photographer. And then later in the day, We'd call Lynn to get her take on the images and models that Susanna had discussed. And then Susanna's next input would take off from Lynn's last thought, and so on and so on. So let's start. We're going to begin our first set of insights from Susanna. As we pointed out in our sixth episode, there are really few people today as qualified as Susanna Brown to talk about fashion photography. She's a curator and art historian, and she's overseen some of the past decade's most impressive photography exhibits at London's Victoria and Albert Museum, including the 2012 exhibit on Cecil Beaton, the museum's 2014 show on Horst, and the acclaimed 2019 show on Tim Walker. As you listen to Susanna, you might want to click on the link in the podcast app in order to view this episode's webpage. We'll be filling that page with links that will allow you to view all the great images that Susanna is describing. Thanks so much for having me back, John. It's great to talk to you again. For me as a historian, this is a really exciting and fascinating period uh, in photographic history and fashion history. And there's so many extraordinary photographers to, to talk about today. 
I think it's really important to think about the wider world events at this period in history. You know, the world is, is very slowly recovering from the horrors of the Second World War. Women have enjoyed much greater independence than ever before. Uh, many of them took jobs for the first time during the war years and we see them to continue to stride out independently post-war. Of course, a new war begins in the 1950s with, with the start of the Vietnam War in 1955, and the, the backdrop of the Cold War and the, the space race is also prominent in the period that we're talking about. In terms of issues of discrimination and segregation, of course, um, the 1964 United States Civil Rights Act is a hugely important moment in history which ends racial segregation in public accommodation and outlaws discrimination in the workplace based not only on race and colour but also on religion and sex. And I think an interesting place to start is with one of the only black fashion photographers of this era, Gordon Parks. Gordon Parks was born in 1912 in Kansas, the youngest of 15 children, and he was born uh, to a tenant farmer named Andrew and Andrew's wife Sarah, and his family faced huge hardship uh, and poverty and were threatened by segregation and violence. But Gordon's mother, Sarah, had a very strong belief that dignity and hard work could uh, overcome bigotry and at the age of 25 he purchased his very first camera from a pawn shop in Seattle. Uh, it was a Voigtlander Brilliant. He later talked about this camera as his choice of weapon. He taught himself within a very short period how to take photographs and before long his pictures were being exhibited in the windows of the Eastman Kodak store in Minneapolis and he started specialising in portraits of African-American women. He also began making fashion pictures uh, for an exclusive clothing store. And as he, his success grew, he moved away to Chicago for uh, greater opportunities. He carried on, in Chicago, he carried on making portraits, but he also turned to photographing the slums on the south side and this work uh, gained him recognition in the form of a, a Julius Rosenwald fellowship and he spent his fellowship as an apprentice with the FSA, the Farm Security Administration's photography project in Washington uh, under the project's director Roy Stryker. And not long after this, the famed art director at Vogue, Alexander Lieberman, caught sight of his work and asked Parks to photograph uh, women's fashions for Vogue and he would regularly contribute to the magazine for about five years from then onwards. In our discussion today, I think it's important to keep in mind the role of Alexander Lieberman, the art director at Vogue, and his counterpart at Harper's Bazaar, Alexei Brodovich. Both these men played a, a huge role in the aesthetic of their respective magazines in this period and both of them were responsible for discovering the talents of some of the 20th century's most extraordinary photographers. As I said, uh, Parks worked for about five years at Vogue but before too long he left the magazine to work as staff photographer for life where uh, he was part of the staff for more than 20 years and, and this period really cemented his reputation as a hugely inf influential humanitarian photojournalist as well as someone with a, a great eye uh, for an elegant fashion study and, and there's sort of two sides to his work throughout his whole career. The one side looking at tough subjects relating to racism, to poverty, to black urban life but also the, the flip side of his career, looking at glamorous Paris fashions, the celebrities of the day and famous politicians. Perhaps um, some of his most famous fashion pictures were taken in 1951. Some of Parks' most uh, memorable 
fashion pictures show the French model Bettina, a great superstar of her era, wearing Balmain. And for those who are familiar with the, the history of fashion photography, when we look at these pictures, we immediately see a connection to another great fashion image maker of the century, Irving Penn, who was working at Vogue. And I think uh, Parks' pictures immediately conjure up the images Penn made a year earlier of his soon-to-be wife, Lisa Fonsengreve's posing in Paris. So let's leave Susanna for a minute to get Lynn Yeager's take on that famous Parks photo of Bettina in Balmain. Those of you who have listened to previous L'Atelier Balmain episodes are already familiar with Lynn. She's an award-winning fashion journalist, and she often writes in the pages of Vogue and the screens of Vogue.com. Lynn is known for her unique ability to mix her design knowledge with often amusing and always thought-provoking takes on class, politics, society, and history. Again, as you listen to Lynn speak, you may want to click on the link in the podcast app in order to view this episode's webpage, because that page has a set of links that allow you to view all the great images that Lynn and Susanna are describing today. Okay, we've already talked about how showroom models and editorial models were two very distinct and different creatures. So let me add just one small asterisk to that discussion. An asterisk which would allow us to mention Bettina Graziani as an exception to that rule. Because every rule has an exception. Bettina was a very successful showroom model, and many of the legendary designers of the day, including Christian Dior, Jacques Fath, and Hubert de Givenchy, all wanted her to work for them in their showrooms. And she also managed to become a very famous editorial model as well. She was photographed by all the great fashion photographers of the day. And since she was the first major French model posing in all the international press, she was seen as an embodiment of the new style and aspirations of a post-war generation of liberated Parisiennes. In fact, when she was awarded France's Order of Arts and Letters in 2010, she was told that she represented the embodiment of the modern woman. Bettina had, well, just like everyone else that Susanna will be discussing today, Bettina had an incredible and fascinating life. She was born Simone Baudin in 1925, and she and her sister were raised by their mother, a schoolteacher in a small town in Normandy, after their father abandoned the family. These fathers were always abandoning the families. As a teenager in Normandy, during the occupation, she had big dreams of becoming a Parisian fashion designer, and after the liberation, she headed off to the big city in search of work. She was able to land an interview with the designer Jacques Costet, who, after seeing her sketches, told her he'd rather hire her as a model. I know the feeling. And she began working in his studio on that same day. And it's easy to see what might have appealed to Costet, because although she might have been on the short side for a model, she was only 5'4", Bettina had a very striking look. She had bright green eyes, high cheekbones, red hair, and freckles. Overall, she had a very fresh, young, and distinctive look. But I have to say, I was just looking at pictures of her, and what we mean by fresh and young today is very different than fresh and young in the period. She's incredibly elegant and sophisticated. Later, she went to work for the designer Jacques Fath, and for four years, she was Fath's muse and the face of the house. Fath believed that Bettina's fresh look was one that matched the house's positioning as an innovative modern house with a light-spirited, more American type of attitude, because we're very light-spirited over here. One of the first things he did was to give her a new name, telling her, we already have a Simone, you look like a Bettina. That wasn't the only change that Fath oversaw. He chopped her hair to a short bob, which actually immediately started a whole new hairstyle trend in Paris. She came to be the epitome of the new, sleek, and chic young Parisienne. In 1950, the photographer Irving Penn brought her to America, where the Ford Modeling Agency snapped her up as their first French model. Her look appealed to the major magazines of the time, and she became the most photographed woman in France, with Penn, Parkinson, and Horse all vying to book her for editorials. She also broke a whole lot of hearts, a lot of famous hearts, including a Hollywood screenwriter, a Paris editor, Robert Kappa, the legendary war photographer, and, according to many rumors, Picasso. Her first marriage to photographer Gilbert Graziani lasted only a few years. Her most famous lover was Prince Ali Khan, who really got around. She first met him when he brought his fiancée, Rita Hayworth, to Jack Fath's showroom to choose a wedding dress. 
that's really nice to like hit on the guy who's bringing his fiance for the wedding dress. But anyway, they grew close after he had divorced Hayworth and decided to reform his life after being passed over for succession as Aga Khan in favor of his own son. Bettina gave up modeling to be with him, but in 1960, they were in a terrible car crash on the way to a party. He was killed and she miscarried the child she was expecting because of the shock. She inherited his chateau at Chantilly and returned to fashion, working as a fashion PR for Valentino and Angaro into the 70s. Even to her very last days, she remained amused to leading designers. Azadine Alaya was greatly inspired by her and was a close friend. He even mounted a 2014 retrospective of her most famous photographs at the small gallery he used to have in the Marais. Of course, the photograph that Susanna was just talking about, Gordon Park's 1951 studio photo of Bettina wearing Balmain, was part of that exhibit. There's a slew of outtakes from that shooting, and one of them is part of the permanent collection of the Corcoran Gallery in Washington. The whole series is really charming. As she twirls around, smiling and completely relaxed in her elegant, nip-waisted Balmain couture, long white gloves, and pillbox hat. It reflected both how Gordon Parks liked to shoot relaxed, non-stiff models in natural poses, like he was catching them off guard, and also that Parks and Bettina were old friends by then. There's another famous photo of Bettina from around the same period that I think really shows her unique, fresh, and relaxed style. In 1950, she was photographed outdoors in Paris by the American photographer Henry Clark as she arranged a small bouquet of daffodils on the back of a card. She's got a relaxed pose that allows the cape at the back of the Balmain design to move with the wind, and a small cap that's posed atop that famous short bob. So here's another transition. And Susanna, as you'll hear, has some great insights to share on that same outdoor photo of Bettina, as well as the photographer who captured it, the American Henry Clark. The Vogue photographer Henry Clark negotiated a unique contract by which from 1951 onwards, he photographed for the French, British and American versions of Vogue and he covered the spring and summer couture collections for the magazines more frequently than any other photographer, which meant that Henry and his Roloflex camera spent a lot of time on aeroplanes. He was also sent to shoot Vogue features around the world in Sicily, in India, in Mexico, Iran, Syria and Jordan. Robin Muir, the brilliant photographic curator and contributing editor at Vogue, wrote that Clark's photographs capture the world of 1950s haute couture more consistently than any other photographer. Clark's models of the early 50s included Bettina and Anne Sainte Marie. He made a fantastic picture of Bettina in a Balmain dress and cape in 1950. We see her standing in slim profile with her gloved hands outstretched in front of her to pick up a bunch of flowers from a cart on a cobbled street. It's very clear that this is a real street, not a studio set, but what makes this picture quite extraordinary is that Clark has placed a studio backdrop behind the model, which is delicately painted with clouds. He probably put it there so that her extraordinary outfit would be clearly seen in the photograph without the distractions of the street clutter behind. But it creates a somewhat strange and I think quite beautiful uh, hybrid of the reportage style and the artifice of the studio photography. Looking at his other Paris photographs of models wearing Pierre Balmain in the 50s, we notice how often he combined historic and contemporary Paris in a single photograph. The cobbled streets, the river, Ausman's grand 19th century boulevards feature alongside graphic posters for new movies or the, the latest theatre productions. A great example is his wonderful picture of Anne Saint-Marie in a pale Balmain coat posing next to posters on the right bank, which was shot for French Vogue in March 1955. Later that year, he photographed her again, this time in a, a more uh, dramatic ensemble, an exquisite seal skin cape by Balmain, which was published in American Vogue in September. 
shining motor cars are often very prominent in Clark's pictures too. And just as air travel was becoming increasingly popular at this time, more and more people were buying cars. And there's a noticeable proliferation of car adverts in fashion magazines in the 50s. Some critics described Clark as a little ostentatious. His close friend, Susan Train, who was American Vogue's Paris bureau chief, recalled his love of racing around the country with two models, a hairdresser and a fleet of cars, she said. And there was a a fabulous Clark photograph in British Vogue in November 1957 of a model in Balmain's bronze check wool suit leaning elegantly on the front of a bright yellow vintage car. It's an extraordinary picture. The the colours are just glorious and it reminds me of that incredible car in The Great Gatsby. Another model that Clark favoured was Nena or Nina von Schleberger. His 1959 picture of her in a voluminous Spalman coat emphasises why he was one of the magazine editor's favourite photographers. He had a real interest in clothing. He wanted to show the garments in detail, the, the line, the cut, how the fabric hangs on the body and so on. And in this picture, she looks straight into the camera just smiling ever so slightly beneath her neat little hat and carrying a bunch of flowers under one arm. She's the absolute epitome of Paris sophistication. And so our game of telephone continues. Let's cut back to Lynn, who's got some interesting background on Nina and her amazing family history, as well as some rather unexpected information about Lynn's own grandmother. Can I just point out that this is exhibit number one in what doesn't work with podcast. With any other medium, I'd be starting off showing you a close-up of Nina von Schlebergy, (laughs) the model that Clark captured in the 1959 photo Susanna was just talking about. And I just casually throw out, hey, remind you of anyone? And unfortunately, I can't even ask you to do a quick Google search because it would take me five minutes to spell out Nina von Schlebergy which I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing correctly. Probably not. So let's just call her Nana. So let's just imagine that I could show you a photo that Henry Clark took of this beautiful Nana. I'd be doing it to make clear that Nana's very famous daughter, Uma Thurman, definitely inherited her mother's amazing looks. Both of them have the same wide set eyes, striking Nordic features, and what used to be called icy beauty. And actually, Nana's own mother, Uma's grandmother, was also one of Europe's legendary beauties another icy girl. Her name was Bridget Holmquist, easier to pronounce, and there's a famous statue of her, life-size, naked, all poised to leap up and take flight into the sky. There's a little-known fact that there's a naked statue of my grandmother in the Bronx, just saying. It was erected in 1930, and it overlooks the harbor at the southernmost point of Sweden. Bridget Holmquist was also a baroness, like my grandmother. And she fell in love with a baron who was 25 years older than her, Frederick Karl Johannes von Schlerberg. Frederick was a successful businessman in Berlin. He was also a devoted monarchist, as barons tend to be, and he was opposed to Hitler's rise to power. He was imprisoned by the Nazis for refusing to join the army and for attempting to save his Jewish friends. Bridget leapt into action. Since she was a Swede, by marrying him, she was able to enable his release. The couple fled the horrors of Nazi Germany, moving to Mexico, where their daughter Nana was born in 1941. Bridget and Nana returned to Sweden after the war, and Norman Parkinson, a legendary British photographer, discovered Nana in Stockholm in 1955 when she was just 14 years old. Two years later, she was living in London and working as a model. There are plenty of striking photos of Nana by Parkinson for various issues of British Vogue and other fashion titles, which I'm sure Susanna will be talking about when she discusses Parkinson's work. After Nana arrived in New York in 1958, Eileen Ford worked hard to ensure that she became one of the early 60s most sought-after models. And although Nana was charging the highest hourly rate and posing for all the leading magazines, it doesn't seem that she was all that much in love with her new uptown life. As so many models are today, she preferred hanging out with scruffy downtown artist types in what was then still the rebellious Greenwich Village. Still rebellious, still big, big fights this summer in Washington Square Park with the police just saying, 
Among her close friends at the time were the beat poets Gregory Corso and Allen Ginsberg. And it was those two who took Nena one weekend on a fateful visit to the Harvard professor and cultural legend Timothy Leary. Leary, of course, was famous at the time for telling students to turn on, tune in, and drop out, which reflected his strong advocacy of LSD and other psychedelic drugs as a shortcut to psychological and religious epiphany. Nena was 28 when she met Leary, who was then 45. But he was quite handsome, actually. They married shortly afterwards in what must have been the most amazing wedding ever seen in upstate New York. Robert Greenfield, Leary's biographer, summed up these nuptials as by describing them as a phantasmagoric magical mystery tour, adding that the wedding was a sort of big coming out party for all the A-list, jet-set, high-fashion, beautiful people from New York who had recently discovered LSD. The newlyweds were gifted with snuff boxes filled with cocaine, as well as various gifts of hash, grass, and psychedelic mushrooms. The wedding cake was one of a kind, topped with the Hindu deities Shakti and Siva having sex. Really tasteful wedding topper. So Nana put a sudden end to her modeling days, and the couple jetted off to a new life in India. Sadly, in spite of those incredible nuptials, the marriage didn't last long, as you may have predicted. The two divorced a little over a year later, shortly after returning to the States. But then, Nana met a student of Leary's, Robert A. F. Thurman, who the LA Times has described as the Billy Graham of Buddhism. And Billy Graham, for our European listeners, is a charismatic Christian fundamentalist who has a huge following in the United States with TV shows and books and his friends of presidents and very much a part of the kind of uh, capitalist religious society here, if that makes any sense. But Thurman was actually much more than that. Thurman is actually quite a serious scholar and quite a respected person in America. He was the first Westerner ordained as a Tibetan monk by the Dalai Lama and has been a prolific campaigner for Tibetan rights for decades. Until 2019, he was a Columbia University religious professor. Robert and Anna married in 1967, and together they've raised four children, Gandon, Dechen, Uma, and Maipan. And I would say Uma got the best of those four names. Uma Thurman recently told Vogue that she'll scream if she reads another article discussing her mother's short marriage to Leary, explaining that people shouldn't be defined by these early alliances in their lives. And hey, she does have a point, and we do expect to hear some screaming soon. The truth is, although it's Nina's short wedding to Leary that gets the attention, she deserves a lot more credit than that. Nina has been working for decades alongside Robert Thurman, serving as managing director of both Menla Mountain Retreat and Tibet House, which is focused on the promotion and preservation of Tibetan culture. But let's switch back, way back, to Nina as a young model in the 50s, so Susanna can talk about her work with Norman Parkinson. Parkinson discovered her in 1955 whilst on a visit to Sweden and created some test shots of her in the forests near Stockholm. In the summer of 1960, they collaborated on a series of pictures taken in the Champagne region of France for the August issue of Queen magazine, which really exemplify Parkinson's skill in combining glamour and humour in his photographs. In one picture, we see her posing in a fleecy hat and coat by Balmain. And she's wearing these immaculate uh, white heels, but she's standing on a, a rather sort of horrible, humble dirt track in this very sumptuous and thick outfit, which must have been incredibly hot for her in France in the middle of summer. And in another picture from this same series, we see her at Plivo Airport in Champagne and she's striding kind of confidently away from a helicopter as it takes flight, as if she's, she's just arrived for a holiday. Unlike most of his predecessors, Norman Parkinson preferred not to direct his subjects. He allowed them instead to be as spontaneous as possible for his camera. And this approach brought a great sense of fun to his pictures. He initially learned his trade in the 30s um, as an apprentice photographer at Spate and Sons in Bond Street in London, a sort of high society portrait studio that catered primarily to, to British aristocrats and well-to-do customers. 
but he was dismissed from his job after moving a camera when he was merely asked to focus the lens. So he he went off and set up his own studio with a partner and received great success by himself. He recalled about this, this period in his career many, many years later that most photographers of the 30s showed women standing in scintillating salons with their knees bolted. He said, I never knew any girls with bolted knees. I only knew girls that jumped and ran. So I started to photograph these girls. Everyone said, how bold. And Parkinson's greatest collaborator in his jumping, running, active pictures was undoubtedly his wife, Wenda Rogerson who was a model and actress originally discovered by Cecil Beaton. Wenda and Norman Parkinson were married for 42 years and were an extremely eye-catching couple. She, the the gorgeous model, and he, this dashing six foot, five inches tall, quintessential eccentric English gentleman with a a sort of military style moustache. Another fantastic husband and wife team was Irving Penn and Lisa Fonson Greaves. We've talked before um, about Lisa. She worked with the photographer Horst long before she met Irving Penn and Horst adored Lisa for her expressive dancer's hands. She first met Penn in 1947 when he photographed the year's 12 leading models for the May issue of American Vogue, and they were married three years later. Penn is the photographer with the longest tenure in the history of Vogue. He joined the magazine in 43, and during his extraordinary 60-year career, he shot almost 170 Vogue covers. He was enormously prolific and enjoyed great success in both his commercial and artistic work. He didn't only shoot fashion. As a a portraitist, he captured dozens of the century's leading cultural and political figures. And as a still life photographer, he was capable of revealing the poetry of simple everyday objects. He was certainly a perfectionist and a purist And Bab Simpson, who worked with him as Vogue fashion editor for many years, joked that first you had to buy 500 lemons for him to pick the perfect one. Then he had to take 500 shots of that lemon until he got the perfect shot. And I I love that quote from Bab Simpson. It really sums up his absolutely diligent kind of lifelong quest for perfection in his images and in his fashion photographs he he became very well known for a a formal clarity and a sort of spare elegance he wanted to produce timeless fashion studies and he described his role as selling dreams not clothes he worked with countless leading models and he described them as ciphers rather than individual personalities. Although we could consider Lisa Fonson Greaves as the exception here. She starred in his series of photographs of Paris haute couture collections for the September 1950 issue of Vogue. And that was a particularly wonderful year for Paris couture. The shoot featured Balmain's draped overcoat with the asymmetrical hem in green wool, alongside the creations of his contemporaries like Balenciaga, Dior and Lanvin. And these images are sublime in their economy. They were shot in a daylight studio against a simple grey backdrop and they came to define his fashion work and this less is more aesthetic. The pictures were actually taken in July and the couple married in September. So there's a a wonderful love story going on 
behind the the fashions here. The studio where the shoot took place was on the top floor of an old photography school and there was no water, no electricity, but Penn thought it was perfect. And he later wrote about the magical quality of light in the studio. He said, the light was the light of Paris as I had imagined it, soft but defining. We found a discarded theatre curtain for a backdrop and Penn went on to use this same backdrop, which is painted with a, a kind of wintry grey Paris sky uh, again and again for subsequent photo shoots. One of his other significant collaborators was Alexander Lieberman, Vogue's art director, who we've already mentioned who later became the editorial director of Condé Nast Publications. And it was Alexander Lieberman who found this perfect Paris studio for Penn. And he later commented on the Penn Fonsengrieve's relationship. He said it represented an extraordinary relationship between a photographer and a model. Alexander Lieberman got it right. There's a whole lot that's extraordinary about Penn and Lisa Fonson Greaves' relationship. Fonson Greaves was really the 20th century's first supermodel, and she managed to stay in the biz for decades. Her work, especially with Horst and Penn, was incredible, resulting in legendary fashion images. And Susanna has already highlighted one of those incredible Horst Fonson Greaves shootings in a previous podcast episode that centered on Horst history with Balmain. Everyone who ever worked with her mentions that she had such a rare and refreshing attitude. She was so down to earth. It doesn't sound like she ever played the diva. So, for example, even though, as Susanna mentioned, Alexander Lieberman highlighted the extraordinary relationship that Fonson Greaves had with Penn, and even though she was the first of the post-war models to be featured on the cover of Time magazine, and that was back in 1949, when being on the cover of Time actually meant something, and even though she was famously the highest paid, highest praised fashion model in the business, she somehow always managed to keep her cool and keep it all in perspective. She'd famously respond to fashion critics praise by saying something like, it's always the dress, it's never, never the girl. I'm just a good clothes hanger. In spite of this humble attitude, she excelled like no one before ever had, and that was due in no part to how she was never anything but professional. Her complete dedication to her job and her determination to always do the best it could, well, it was quite impressive. For her, modeling was a serious occupation that had nothing to do with having fun. Her super professionalism is clear even in the language that she was used to refer to her work. She always preferred to use the word sitting instead of shooting, and her favorite word for a booking was a seance. She was obsessed with helping to make clear why the couturier had created the design. She always wanted to display the creations exactly how the designer wished it for them to be worn, and she always was looking to improve her skills as a model. That's why when she wasn't being shot in the studio, she was at the Louvre or another museum, studying paintings and sculpture in order to see how the masters posed their subjects. Fashion critics described how she would first start each job with a long examination of each dress and practicing how to best move and sit. Her ballet training and her background as a dance teacher were always obvious. She knew just how to pose her body, just how to set the expressive hands and her face just right. And believe it or not, throughout her whole career, she always insisted on being responsible for her own hair and makeup. So Foss and Grease was a million light years away from today's cliché and tabloid headlines of how a model behaves. She was definitely not someone throwing tantrums. She was not surrounded by PR flax. There were no minders, no on-the-set calls to financial advisors, and no contract clauses insisting on personal jets. But don't worry, we'll be talking about these fun models pretty soon. So let's do a quick bio. Foss and Grease was born in 1911 in Udavala, Sweden. She studied dance in Berlin and later moved to Paris, where she worked with her first husband, Fernand Fossengreaves, a French dancer who became a respected fashion photographer. She soon was modeling for French Vogue with Horst, and during the war, she moved to New York, where she began working for American magazines. By the 50s, she had married a second time to Irving Penn, but she worked for all the greats. She stopped modeling in the 60s, becoming a sculptor and traveling with her husband to assist on fashion and exotic photo sessions all across the world. She died at age 80 in 1992. Penn died 17 years later in 2009. 
there were numerous other photographers who formed strong collaborations with models, although they weren't necessarily models that they were married to. Louise Dahl Wolf, for example, worked with Mary Jane Russell for more than a decade. Dahl Wolf enormously valued Russell's input on shoots, making their photographers really a, a joint effort. Russell was fairly short for a model, but she had a very long, graceful neck, and Dahl Wolf adored her individuality, later saying about her, I hated the popular look of models in those days. I called it the candy box look, all translucent white skin, blonde hair and blue eyes. I liked yellowish skin and green eyes, and I found it with Betty Bacall and above all with Mary Jane Russell, who was marvellous. And it's quite staggering, I think, that by the end of her career, an estimated 30% of Dahl Wolf's photos featured Russell. Louise Dahl Wolf had a reputation of being a bit of a dictator with fashion models, and it seems that many models were more than a little afraid of saying anything to her during a shoot. But somehow it was different from Mary Jane Russell. As Susanna notes, Russell was Dahlwolf's favorite model and she brought a distinct personality and life to Dahlwolf's photos, a look that was a bit different from all the blondes dominating the field at the time. Their friendship lasted 12 years and it resulted in several iconic images. Russell described their working relationship by saying, One was never selfish with Louise. There was an extraordinary immediate communication of her conscientiousness, her seriousness. She was wicked, challenging, exasperating, and heavenly. It was a rare, rare, extraordinary experience. She was the most beautiful person in my working life. Russell began modeling in 1948, and she also worked often for the other greats of the time, Penn, Avedon, and William Klein. Today, though, she's better known for two things that had nothing to do with fashion. She and her husband, her high school sweetheart, wrote a long series of love letters while he was in the Navy, serving in the South Pacific. At the beginning of their correspondence, he famously wrote her first letter addressed to the most beautiful girl in the world. And this is from a song that goes, The most beautiful girl in the world picks my ties out. Just in case nobody knows where that came from. He didn't originate that phrase. So anyway, he wrote to the most beautiful girl in the world, care of Sarah Lawrence College, where she was studying. And the letter made it. They married immediately after he returned, and their letters were published 20 years ago as part of a best-selling book and documentary titled Love Stories of World War II and edited by the late Larry King of CNN. Some law students may recognize her name, and I know a lot of law students are secretly listening to our Bauman podcast when they should be studying for the bar. Anyway, listen up, law students. You may recognize her name from a famous legal case regarding model releases, which is still included in many legal textbooks. Model releases are the contracts that models sign at each photo shoot, giving the client the right to publish the photo. Russell had originally posed for Avedon for an ad for a bookshop and signed to release for that shooting. She was photographed in bed with a man with both of them reading with the caption for people who take their reading seriously. A few years later, another company, Spring Mills, which sold bed sheets, bought that image. Spring Mills was known at the time for relying on rather dicey ads, so they had a hard time persuading the top models to work for them. The company retouched the photo to give the guy a beard and ran it as an ad inside Look, Ladies Home Journal, and other magazines as part of a promotion asking readers to submit captions such as Lost Between the Covers. Russell believed that the ad was damaging to her reputation and she sued the two companies involved and the magazines that ran the ad. The case went to the New York Supreme Court, which held for Russell, setting an important legal precedent for models' rights. The ruling stated that the release form that Russell had signed was not transferable and that alterations to the photo meant that it was no longer the portrait she had agreed to shoot with Avedon. Mary Jane Russell was awarded damages by the court, and she may be the only top model who's known today for setting important legal precedents in contract law. Dahl Wolf was certainly one of the most prolific contributors to Harper's Bazaar, and she was employed by the magazine from 1936 until 1958. She'd originally trained as a designer and an artist, and she brought to her photography a great sense of composition and form. She produced a massive 86 cover photographs for the magazine and thousands of interior shots. 
Above all, she favoured natural daylight and she had an immense flair for colour. Soon after her arrival at the magazine, Kodak had launched Kodachrome and that was the medium she exploited to full advantage in her wonderful depictions of the modern American woman. She became particularly known for shooting in exotic locations and shooting outdoors and undoubtedly her most famous pictures capture casual American fashions and new sportswear of the 1940s and 50s. Although she was most famous for her her photographs of American designs, from time to time she also photographed Paris Couture. And one of my personal favourite pictures shows Mary Jane Russell in a Balmain evening gown in 1955. It's a picture that's intended to look candid as if we just walked into this elegant, sumptuous home and we see a woman preparing for a night out. Her young son uh, is helping her to get ready and although this is taking place in a very grand interior, it's also quite a touching, quiet family moment. And Dahl Wolf cleverly uses a mirror behind the model to give the viewer or the reader of a magazine a much clearer picture of this gorgeous Balmain dress. And that's a trick that countless photographers used to help magazine readers see the garments more clearly. William Klein, for example, took the use of mirrors to extremes in 1963 when he shot Dorothy McGowan in Balmain's black and white tweed suit. He placed her in a mirrored room to create infinite reflections and we see her outfit from every angle, taking in the the double-breasted jacket, the shiny gilt buttons, the narrow sleeves and the rolled back collar as well as her fantastic domed white felt hat. Klein even sometimes worked with mirrors outdoors and it was his painting teacher, Fernand Leisure, who advised him to leave the studio and explore the streets of the city. Klein joined Vogue in 55 and he often employed his second-hand Leica camera as well as equipment much less associated with fashion image making such as wide-angle and telephoto lenses all in order to create pictures that reflected his personal experiences of the dynamism and the strangeness of the modern metropolis. Klein broke a lot of the conventional rules of magazine photography He relished blurry pictures, camera flare, grainy images and the the distortion created by the wide-angle lens. Like the photographers Frank Horvat and Bruce Davison, Klein had a background in 35mm reportage photography and their approach turned fashion spreads into visual narratives that really echoed the, the style of new wave cinema in France. Klein's collaborations with Dorothy McGowan extended into movies as well and she starred in his 1996 film Who Are You, Polly Magoo, which satirised the excesses of fashion, media and TV. Dorothy McGowan had to have been a whole lot of fun to work with. It's really easy to see her adventurous spirit in so many of the legendary images that captured her wearing Paris's best couture collections. And after having read through all her interviews to prepare for today's talk, I have to say that it's clear that her exuberance and bold spirit sets her apart from so many of those austere models of the time. She comes across as someone who is up for anything, always up for a good time, which helps explain why so many of the greats loved working with her. She was born in 1939 in Brooklyn to Irish immigrants. She trained as a dancer, but she was told she was too tall. So she answered an ad for models that she saw in the New York Times. And within a few months, she was in the studio working with Irving Penn. But it's really her work with William Klein that most of us remember today. They were quite the duo. Seven years ago, she told Harper's Bazaar that she had a blast whenever she worked with Klein. She explained that she always felt like she was just hanging out with one of her older brothers and she adored every one of what she called their crazy ideas. She noted that she was often one of the few models who felt free enough to sign on for those crazy ideas. For example, once she was at her apartment talking to him and he asked what was all that noise that he kept hearing in the background. 
She explained to him that the Beatles were staying in the nearby Hotel Delmonico and that the Fab Force fans had filled the street and kept screaming up to the hotel rooms. So Klein grabbed his camera, rushed over. He ended up taking a series of pictures of McGowan set in the middle of the screaming Beatle fans, with McGowan screaming like she was just another crazed teenager. As Susanna just mentioned, McGowan was famously cast by Klein as the star of his iconic black and white film, Who Are You, Polly Magoo? If you don't already know this film, I guess you should go and see it, although super off the record, I think it's heavy sledding. I never could quite get through it, but it is a famous, iconic fashion film, and for all of you nascent fashion historians out there, go and see it, and the look of it is fabulous. Anyway, it's a scathing and some people think hilarious take on the fashion world's pretensions. It's filmed in a sort of cinema verite style and it's filled with an amazing set of characters, including an incredible high priestess of a fashion editor who was clearly modeled on Diana Vreeland. The film concentrates on McGowan as a sort of modern Alice in Wonderland character. She's an American supermodel named Polly and she attempts to find her way through the very strange fashion world filled with excesses and crazy personalities. Initially, the distributors were pushing hard to have Polly played by a French star, someone like Deneuve or Bordeaux, but Klein insisted on McGowan and he managed to convince the producer that she was right for the role. In fact, when Klein called McGowan to ask her to meet with the producer in Paris, McGowan was already in the French capital, working on a very famous shoot with the photographer Melvin Sokolsky. Dorothy McGowan was also a favourite of Melvin Sokolsky. He was a self-taught photographer and he joined Harper's Bazaar in 1958. He went on to create some of the most famous images in the history of fashion photography, the so-called Bubble series of March 1963. This extraordinary series was initially inspired by the transparent orbs in the famous painting The Garden of Earthly Delights by the Netherlandish master Hieronymus Bosch. He shot the model wearing spring collection looks, floating in a giant plexiglass bubble above the streets of Paris. In one shot, she wears Balmain's summer evening dress, described in the magazine as a graceful fool of white jersey with a petal pink streamer floating over one shoulder held by a ribbon at the bosom. And in subsequent years, Melvin Sokolsky has talked a lot about these iconic pictures and, and he's often said that today he could never pull off a shoot like that because of insurance and, and the permits required. In fact, at the time they arrived in Paris and then he discovered that getting the permits would take three months uh, and there simply wasn't time for that. So he called on a friend to help him, the husband of a model that he knew who played cards with the Paris chief of police. So they, they had a, a sort of agreement that whenever someone came around looking for a permit, they'd swing the door open and he would give a salute and they would stop work. So it was, it was a kind of clever ruse to get around uh, the lack of permits. But uh, there were many other iconic pictures that Sokolsky created after this series for Harper's Bazaar. Two years later, he made a model fly again. This time it was Klein's favourite, Dorothy McGowan. We see her gliding through a chic French restaurant. And what's extraordinary, I think, about these pictures is that the, the diners below her continue their meal, apparently completely oblivious to what's happening directly over their heads. And there's a great interview with Dorothy McGowan from 2013 in which she says, when I did those flying pictures with Sokolsky, no one even thought about insurance. I didn't know this at the time, but he had told the crew, listen, that's your child out there dangling. If anything happens to her, treat it like one of your children. We all cared about each other. We really worked very hard. Melvin was very demanding, but once you sign on, you sign on and you go. Bill's the same. And she's talking about William Klein here. She says, they're both idea people. They get obsessed with their ideas and you get carried along and you do something and it plays into whatever they thought of. And I love this interview with Dorothy because it, it really emphasizes the collaborative nature 
of the creation of a fashion picture and also the very real dangers that models often put themselves in in order that the photographer could get the perfect shot. As those amazing Sokolsky images make clear, models were increasingly being asked to do more and more intrepid things. Basically, now we've reached a point in fashion history where a whole new type of shooting is being introduced. Within just a few short decades, well, all decades are the same length, but within a few decades, fashion editorials had moved from photographing society and royals in posh drawing rooms and palace gardens to capturing beautiful models flying over Paris dinners and floating over New York in bubbles. Remember, there was no way to do this digitally, so models actually had to do these things. They had to climb inside a plastic bubble or get hitched to a harness or whatever was in the photographer's imagination. They had to literally fly. What's kind of shocking is to realize how little has changed over the many years since Sokolsky strapped beautiful Dorothy into a harness to dangle her over diners below. Models continue to be placed in precarious situations, often with little or no thought to their safety and protection. I guess for some people, it's hard to stir up any sort of outrage on behalf of models. But please remember that these are working girls earning a living. They're not just beautiful goddesses constantly jetting across the world to pose in fabulous clothes in exotic locales. In fact, being a model is very hard work and most of the time not particularly glamorous. And the fact is, very often models are treated as simply one more easily replaced component of a shoot, not really as humans. Yes, of course, every few years, the industry gets up in arms about horrible agents, companies and photographers recruiting teens, exploiting them, pushing them into work with few available protections, and often following up by stealing a big chunk of money from these innocent girls. Of course, we all know already the almost inevitable outcome of this system. A string of abuses, including impossible body standards, fostering eating disorders and unchecked powerful men, and yes, it's always men, leading to the all-too-common tales of sexual abuse and harassment. New York Magazine's Matthew Steyer recently wrote a great article on this topic, if you're interested. He interviewed the model Karen Elson and others about the system's continuing abuses, and Elson had some fascinating stories, and I mean fascinating in a bad way, that she shared. She explained that in the end, the fashion just continues to say, hey, we're sorry that happened, but wow, what great pictures. There's one story she tells where she was being shot in a tank of water, a setup meant to suggest an underwater sea location. And since the water wasn't as clean and pretty as they desired, believe it or not, they dumped bleach into the tub. And so poor Karen, eyes and skin burning, ends up in the emergency room. I interviewed her recently as well for Vogue and um, in conjunction with her newly published autobiography, and she has many harrowing tales to tell. Anyway... Uh, Back to the story of her getting bleached and ending up in the emergency room. The cherry on the cake for that particular story is that the agent calls and says they need to send flowers. But not to Elsid, of course. They sent the flowers to the client. In the end, from the time of Dorothy McGowan to Karen Elson, many models have been willing to put up with shady situations, dangerous setups, and the surprisingly low pay they receive for magazine editorials because they know it helps create the kind of fame and buzz needed for them to be considered for lucrative ad contracts and commercials are where models can make money. And can I also point out that there is a practice in the United States, which I think is still going on, where the models are paid in clothes. And I think that's illegal in France, but in America, they actually tell you to pick out an outfit and they don't pay you at all. In the 50s and 60s, the models were hoping to work with many of the photographers that Susanna has mentioned up to now. But above all, it seems that they were particularly eager to work with one young, very talented photographer, Richard Avedon. They knew Avedon could make their career happen. And besides that, they knew he had the reputation of being someone who respected models and loved working with them as partners in a collaborative process. Undoubtedly, Sokolsky's pictures are are pure fantasy. They're, They're absolute magic. And we might say the same about Richard Avedon, who really ranks alongside Penn as one of the most famous of the post-war fashion photographers. And while Irving Penn was at Vogue, Avedon was at Harper's Bazaar, and they represent, I think, two very different approaches. Penn is about a a purity, a spareness, and a a minimalism, whereas Avedon is is much more about an exuberance and an energy and, and life out on the streets. 
But both these men were the great heroes of post-war fashion photography. Avdin's talent was spotted very early on by Alexei Brodovich. And from the very beginning, he had an extraordinary career. He was highly imaginative and had a, an infectious energy. Richard Avedon's success at Harper's Bazaar was rapid and enormous. And as a young photographer, he was sent to Paris to cover the 1946 collections, bringing back for American readers the splendor of the couture. And he went on to photograph the Paris collections for four decades. Undoubtedly, his Devima with Elephants is his most famous picture of Paris couture. It shows Devima, one of his favourite models, uh, who was nicknamed the Dollar a Minute Girl, standing next to Elephants at the circus. And to me, this is a picture of oppositions lithe and lumbering, youthful and aged, black and white. And like many of his other photographs, at its very heart is the subject of aging. His large format camera captures every individual wrinkle in the elephant's thick skin and every tiny dry stalk of straw on the ground of the circus. When Avedon found this extraordinary location, he immediately knew he had the potential to create what he described as a kind of dream image. He later in his career moved towards a more minimal presentation, producing pictures without any props or distracting elements. But to my mind, this will forever be his most iconic picture of the couture. Dovima was one of the handful of incredible creatures that served as a muse for Avedon, and she definitely had an exotic name to match her glamorous regal image. But the truth is, she was a half-Irish, half-Polish girl from Queens, and her name was Dorothy Juba. She was born in 1927, and when she was 10, she contracted rheumatic fever and spent the next seven years at home taught by tutors. When she started modeling... The new name that she chose to use was that of the imaginary friend who had kept her company while she was stuck at home during most of her childhood. Or perhaps that exotic model name was created from the first two letters of each of her given names, Do for Dorothy, Vi from Virginia, and Ma for Margaret. Or maybe it was Do for Dorothy, Vi for Victory, and Ma for her Ma, to whom she was very attached. Yes, Jovima seems to have given interviewers quite a few different origin stories for her famous name. Anyway, we all love a model discovery story, so here goes. One day, the then Dorothy was waiting for her friend outside a Manhattan office building. An editor who worked at Vogue, which was located in the same building, spied her and convinced her to make tests for the magazine studios. Or maybe that isn't what happened. Maybe she was discovered walking out of the automat with her first husband, Jack Golden, when a Vogue staffer spotted her on the street and said, hey, you should be a model. Once again, Dovima seems to have given different origin stories for different publications. Anyway, once Vogue saw the test pics, Dorothy Juba was booked for Penn Studio the next day for her first modeling job. Or was her first session with Horst? Again, a few different stories. She initially kept her mouth shut until she could get some needed dental work, and that gave her a mysterious look that reminded many of the Mona Lisa. Within a few years, she was one of the most popular models at Ford where she was making $30 an hour while the other top models were only making $25. In her obituary in the Times, Jerry Ford, who ran the agency with his wife Eileen, described her as the super sophisticated model during a sophisticated time, definitely not the girl next door. She quickly became Avedon's favorite. Avedon believed she was the most remarkable and unconventional beauty of her time, and he guaranteed that she became a face known throughout the fashion world filling page after page of fashion magazines and helping to make her the top choice for key advertising campaigns of the era. Dovima described her relationship with Avedon as being like that of identical twins, explaining that she always could sense what he wanted even before he explained it himself. She noted, He would ask me to do some extraordinary things, but I always knew I was going to be part of a great picture. <laughs> 
And of course, one of those extraordinary things was to pose grandly in an evening gown set between two enormous elephants inside Paris's Cirque d'Hiver. That 1955 image, maybe the most well-known fashion shot of the post-war era, recently sold for almost a half million dollars at a Christie's photography auction. Time magazine summed it up as a photograph that blurred the line between commercial fashion photography and art when it was selected as one of the 100 most influential images of all time. Another famous Dovima Avedon shooting took place in Egypt. Avedon, noting that Dovima resembled the famous bust of the Egyptian Queen Nefertiti, took her to Egypt, where he posed her in front of the Sphinx and other incredible runes. The images are amazingly beautiful, and according to legend, when she arrived, someone asked her what she thought of Africa. Africa, she famously answered. Who said anything about Africa? This is Egypt. When it was explained to her that Egypt actually was in Africa, Dovima quickly replied in her thick queen's accent, I should have charged my double rate. As beautiful and dreamlike as her legendary images might have been, Dovima's life story did not have a happy ending. She left Ford to try to start her own agency, and things went downhill from there. She had at least one abusive husband, and she tragically lost custody of her daughter when, after a bitter divorce, she was accused of trying to kidnap the child from her ex. After a failed acting career, she ended up in Fort Lauderdale, living with her mom and working in a pizza parlor. She died in Florida at 63 in 1990. Of course, not all Avedon models had such tragic trajectories. During the same years that he was shooting Dovima, he was also shooting legendary images with other famous models, many taking place in Paris. He returned to Paris the following year in 1956 and this time photographed Susie Parker wearing Balmain. She poses with this incredible sash or, or silken uh, train billowing out beside her to the left of the frame and a black umbrella above her head. And it's so typical of Avedon, the dress and the garments are full of movement. When we think back to pre-war pictures and those models who often appear very static, almost like shop mannequins in the studio, Avedon is the, the polar opposite of that. His, his models are full of energy, of dynamism, of life and joy. And he photographs them in 56 in some of the most typical French uh, venues across the city of Paris, places like the Café de Beauvoir, Susie Parker again, wearing a gorgeous dress by Balmain. And in these pictures, we see men often as um, visual props. In this particular shot, it's Gardner McKay, who is, is really there to make the model look even better. The men aren't in the pictures to display fashions. They, they are there as partners to the women and to, to help the women shine. The following year, in 57, uh, he created a particularly memorable picture of Barbara Mullen dancing again with a very handsome partner uh, in evening dress, wearing a creamy, white Balmain satin dress uh, embroidered with very delicate blue and coral beads by Balmain. And, and again, what we see in this picture is a wonderful sense of flow, of movement, of the, the dynamism of these garments on the female form. Towards the end of the 50s, he photographed uh, Audrey Hepburn, Barbara Mullen, and other models wearing dresses by Balmain, Dior, Patu at Maxime's in Paris. And Audrey Hepburn here, of course, is the, the star of the image. He places her very much front and centre, dead centre in the photograph. And while we see the other models in profile, we see Audrey Hepburn full face. Um, although she's not looking at the camera, she's got this wonderful coquettish look on her face. She's, she's looking up and away from the frame, one hand lightly resting on her beautiful cheek. Okay, can I just say that we really need someone to make a documentary about Avedon and all his muses, starting with the women and shootings that Susanna has mentioned and continuing on 
through all the other great beauties of the 20th century that Avedon partnered with on shootings. It's a beyond fascinating subject. Actually, in his 2004 obituary, it was noted that Avedon had actually begun his own book on his fav- famous muses, and that he had already started collaborating with Jean Shrimpton, Penelope Tree, and others. Someone needs to look into the status of that book and make sure it gets turned into a documentary because, need I add, the images and videos alone would be amazing. Sorry, but it's time to return to an earlier point. The reason why so many models for so many decades dreamed of working with Avedon. They knew, of course, that when Avedon was the photographer, there was a guarantee of incredible images, and therefore fame might follow, as well as the money from the commercial work. But it wasn't just about those final images. Models always made clear that they very much enjoyed the process of collaborating with Avedon on his legendary shootings. In large part, this is because Avedon set himself apart with his incredible respect for the women who worked with him. And, well, sadly, that isn't always the case with fashion photographers. Unfortunately, we have all heard many stories about too many of today's lesser talents abusing their power over models in hideous ways. Richard Avedon was a too rare shining example that it doesn't have to be that way. He was known for displaying an unusual amount of empathy for the women that he worked with, understanding that many were very young and often quite insecure. Susie Parker, the star model of the 1950s, summed up Avedon's distinct attitude when she told an interviewer, He's the most wonderful man in the world because he realizes that models are not simply coat hangers. And Avedon, in an interview in the 80s, relied on some very direct and easy-to-understand terms when he explained why he believed it was important for a photographer to always be the consummate professional. And we're paraphrasing here because baby Linny is a very delicate girl. So let us just say that he said, you can't screw around and photograph at the same time. Although he used another word, to take the place of screw around. In less graphic terms, he added, taking fashion pictures of models is not a matter of arousal. It's hard work. His great talent, empathy, and unusual collaborative attitude allowed Avedon to play a key part in the discovery and promotion of several generations worth of supermodels, from Dovima, Dorian Lee, and Susie Parker in the 50s, through Varushka, Lauren Hutton, and Angelica Houston in the 60s and 70s. And then the 80s with the famous images of Brooke Shields, well, all the way up to the 90s with his amazing photographs of Stephanie Seymour. Avedon's history of discovering models was the basis for the plot of the 1956 film Funny Face. And I gotta say, much easier than watch than Oued Vu, Polly Magoo, just saying. The Avedon role is played by Fred Astaire, too old for the role, but it's still Fred. And the model that he discovers, played by Audrey Hepburn. Audrey channels the feisty spirit of the strong-spirited young woman who's more interested in books than fashion magazines. And Hepburn's character is based on the model Susie Parker, who was one of Avedon's most famous muses. Avedon was hired as visual and consultant for the film, which serves as a gentle satire of the excesses of the fashion world. Once again created an eccentric character loosely modeled on legendary editor Diana Freeland. Watch it if you're looking for a fun break. It really is a fun movie, not like other fashion movies I could mention. There's an interesting backstory to Avedon's choice of muses, which is less cheerful than that film. I had to be a little bit in love with my models, Avedon once explained, and the origin of that love was rooted in family tragedy. When he was beginning to build his portfolio, Avedon would often photograph his younger sister Louise. Louise was a great beauty, but as a young woman, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. She ultimately died in a mental institution, and Avedon was forever haunted by her death and always remembered her beauty. In a 1985 interview in Egoist magazine, Avedon noted Louise's great influence on his work, explaining that Louise's beauty was the event of our family and the destruction of her life. She was very, very beautiful. She was treated as if there was no one inside her perfect skin, as if she was simply her long throat, her deep brown eyes. All my first models, Dorian Lay, Elise Daniels, Carmen, Marella Agnelli, Audrey Hepburn, were brunettes and had fine noses, long throats, oval faces. They were all memories of my sister. By the end of the 1950s, Couture was to some extent in decline, and it's fair to say the central point of the fashion world was gradually shifting once again 
This was a, a moment of dramatic、um, social evolution, and London became an epicenter for young designers, young artists, and fashion photographers. And London was very much the heart of the cultural movement that Diana Rieland termed youth quake. The mainstream newspapers were also featuring fashion pictures more and more. As stylish but affordable mass-produced designs were becoming much more widely available, this was a, a more democratic approach to fashion than we'd ever seen before. The British photographer John French became well known for a very high contrast approach to photography in order to create. The the necessary resolution for black and white images to be reproduced effectively on cheap newspaper, but he was later eclipsed in his fame by several of his young assistants, namely Terence Donovan, Brian Duffy, and David Bailey, who would go on to become the star photographers in the nineteen sixties swinging London. Bailey was first employed to shake up a section of British Vogue that was called the Young Idea, and he had a, a bubbly, vivacious documentary approach that turned the teenage models of the era, like Twiggy and Jean Shrimpton, into household names and international stars. Bailey was self-taught. And learnt much from the master John French, and his style is distinctive in that it, it largely comprises very stark white backgrounds, uncompromising cropping, and seemingly spontaneous, undirected poses. His models often appear as if they could be dancing to the latest pop music in the studio. And from the very beginning of his career, which has now spanned more than six decades, and he's still working today, his pictures have really conveyed a very radical sense of sexuality and of youth. Undoubtedly, his most important model in the early years was his girlfriend Jean Shrimpton, and he said of her, "She was magic." And the camera loved her too. In a way, she was the cheapest model in the world. You only needed to shoot half a roll of film, and then you had it. She just had that knack of having her hand in the right place. She knew where the light was. She was just a natural. And there's a, a fantastic picture of Jean Shrimpton modelling Balmain for David Bailey、um, that was photographed for the March 1964 issue. Of Vogue, we see her from the back and quite tightly cropped against a typical Bailey backdrop, completely white, stark backdrop, and she has this extraordinary sort of sculptural hairstyle by Vidal Sassoon that we see in great detail. And you know, at the, at the hands of another photographer, I think it could be almost comic. The hairstyle is so avant-garde, so strange. But in the hands of Bailey, it just makes an exquisite composition, and it's perfectly lit. It's super simple, stripped back in its aesthetic, and highly memorable because of its simplicity. Expanding on Susanna's point, this definitely was a time of great societal changes. Over the past few episodes, we've returned a few times to the twentieth century's. Loosening of the rigid class system in Britain. Initially, there was just a bit of gradual shifting post World War One, just enough to allow an upper class driver like Cecil Beaton the chance to actually cross over and become accepted by the aristocratic class that he so often longed to be part of. Of course, major barriers were still very much in place in Britain. Even after World War Two had ended, the power of London society, royalty, and money held sway. As we saw a few episodes ago, when we examined Pierre Balmain's embrace by Beaton and his lifelong friend Lady Cooper after that first Balmain show, and we saw that powerful duo help push Balmain into the small protected world of the upper class, and most recently in our previous episode, we got a sense of how societal changes beginning to quicken in the 50s and early 60s, when a working class showgirl helped to set in motion the eventual fall of Harold Macmillan's conservative government. 
ushering Labour, the working class party, into power. So, let's say London and the UK and fashion were becoming maybe a little bit more egalitarian day by day. By the time we reach the story of Bailey and Shrimpton, it's clear that there was no going back. Bailey was a cocky, cockney East Londoner. He dropped out of school at 15, and he was, at that stage, basically uneducated. In fact, if it hadn't been for his service in the Air Force, it's possible that he might have remained illiterate. If you want to know what kind of upbringing he had, consider this interesting fact. His father, a tailor and nightclub operator, actually had a mouth-to-ear scar which had required 68 stitches to close. It had been given to him by the infamous Cray brothers, the identical twin gangsters who ruled East London's organized crime world through the 50s and 60s. In fact, Bailey famously photographed the pair in the 60s. There's also a movie about them. I can't remember the name of it. Maybe it's the Crays. When he was born, David Bailey joined the lowest tier of Britain's then rigid class system. And in previous decades, that would have been it for him. But he had talent and he had nerve. And the post-war economy was booming, allowing for smart, hard-working guys like him to grab their chance. The country's infamous class ceiling was just beginning to crack, and he was one of the early success stories. To put it into context, at the same time, four young men from Liverpool were changing the world of music. And designers were sewing up clothes and sticking them in the windows in Carnaby Street. Things were really changing in England. Bailey first began to master the skills needed for photography when he was in the service, stationed in Singapore. And when he returned to London, he started interning with the leading photographers of the time. Then, at the tender age of 20, he landed a position with the team at British Vogue. And it's hard to say that until he arrived, British Vogue had never seen a young and wild talent quite like him. Bailey pushed for changes, and he pushed hard. One of the most notable of these changes was that he forced the very aristocratic editor at the time to let him photograph a beautiful farmer's daughter that he had discovered, Jean Shrimpton. The editor, Lady Claire Rendlesham, as perhaps her name might suggest, was a bit more partial to shots of aristocrats doing sophisticated aristocratic things in polished aristocratic settings. Bailey and Shrimpton's collaboration were both witty and gritty. They famously flew to New York in 1962, where Bailey shot her in distinctly non-glam, non-posed street scenes during a winter that was so bitterly cold that the camera kept sticking to Bailey's fingers. Even today, those black and white images remain impressive, and they were recently republished in a beautiful thin volume entitled NYJS Day B62. They helped to make very clear why both Shrimpton and Bailey had such an impact upon fashion in the 60s. And today, those shots are still often cited as inspirations by leading fashion designers. Shrimpton's fresh look was a complete contrast to the previous decade's preference for aristocratic regal beauties. And she quickly became the leading model of the time, landing on dozens of magazine covers. As for Bailey's relationship with models, do you remember the 90s phrase, modelizer? For reference, here's how our friend Carrie Bradshaw defined that phrase during an episode of Sex in the City. Don't pretend you don't watch that. Don't pretend you don't watch reruns of that to this day. Anyway, as Carrie said, modelizers are obsessed not with women, but with models, who in most cities are safely confined to billboards and magazines. But in Manhattan, they actually run wild on the streets, turning the city into a virtual model country safari where men can pet their creatures in their natural habitat. David Bailey was a compulsive modelizer, his swinging 60s persona that famously inspired the 1966 Antonioni movie Blow Up, another very good movie, although many today compare his style to something more akin to that of Austin Powers. I think that's a little rough, but, you know, I'm fond of Austin Powers. Another good movie. He was, let's just say, constantly mixing business with pleasure. Bailey met Trimpton when she was just 17, and in 1963, he left his first wife for her. But Trimpton found she couldn't deal with all the philandering, and she left Bailey for another very handsome cockney talent, Terrence Stamp. Bailey made very clear that Trimpton's exit didn't really bother him that much. I had three or four other girls on the go, Bailey said of the breakup. I couldn't really complain. And a few years after Shrimpton left, Bailey married Catherine Deneuve. That marriage ended in 1972, after yet another 17-year-old model... Penelope Tree caught Bailey's eye. He married the model Marie Helvin in 1974 and stayed with her for a whole long eight years. And then in 1986, he married the model Catherine Dyer, who is 20 years younger than he is. They're still together. Bailey actually still continues to work, shooting the occasional campaign and showing exhibits of his sculptures and artwork in London galleries. In fact, only four years ago, he shot a portrait of Olivier Roustang for Interview Magazine. 
Jean Shrimpton, for her part, moved to Wales in 1969 after she ended her modeling career. She eventually married and opened a small hotel in Cornwall. Bailey and Shrimpton both showed how fashion reflected a shift in society as the class system was loosening. But as we all know, fashion and society still has a long way to go when it comes to race. In the 1960s, we see that the notion of ideal beauty is gradually broadening in mainstream magazines, but it is a slow evolution. Donnell Luna was the first African-American model to appear uh, on the cover of British Vogue in March 66, photographed by Bailey, but it wasn't until August of 1974 the first black model appeared on the cover of American Vogue, and that was an image of Beverly Johnson by Francesco Scavullo. But there were also numerous magazines launched during this period, particularly targeted at African-American readers and followers of fashion. We started our conversation today talking about Gordon Parks, and I think it's interesting to return to him now. This was an, an era in which a number of different new magazines were launched specifically targeted at African-American readers and followers of fashion. And one of the most important of these was Essence magazine, which Gordon Parks helped to launch in 1970. And in fact, he was editorial director of Essence from 70 to 73. In his later career, he was also a prolific writer and a composer, and he never saw his race as a barrier to his creativity and the career that he dreamed of. It is shocking to go back today and look at fashion from the mid-century. The total absence of women of color in most leading magazines, issue after issue, year after year, decade after decade, is matched, unfortunately and unsurprisingly, by the all-white runways and all-white rosters of the leading modeling agencies. Fashion seldom leads, and throughout the 20th century, fashion definitely lagged behind, often very far behind. Let's remember, as we talk about how the limits imposed by class were loosening and fashion was reflecting that, those changes were happening at a time when there was open and unabashed and unapologetic racism in both Europe and the United States. The Supreme Court may have ruled against school segregation back in 1954, but there was a very long struggle ahead. For example, when Bailey and Trimpton were shooting those legendary images in Manhattan, the U.S. still had many states where mixed marriages were illegal. Another country where mixed marriages were illegal was South Africa. That country was under a particularly brutal system of institutional racism, which was known as apartheid when Vogue sent Norman Parkinson there to shoot some of his most iconic fashion images. So no, fashion at that time was sadly not taking the lead in the fight for changes. Although to be fair, there were some early voices in fashion who pushed for change. Obviously, Gordon Parks about whom we spoke at the very beginning of this episode, was an amazing talent and conscience. This fascinating man was light years ahead of the rest of the fashion industry in many ways. Richard Avedon also had a long history of financial, artistic, and vocal support for the civil rights movement. His 1964 book, Nothing Personal, was created in partnership with his high school friend, the great black writer James Baldwin, with Baldwin's text attacking the damaging racial and ethnic hierarchies of the time. Avedon shot Dr. King and other leaders in the fight for equal justice. He also trained the young photographers of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC, that, along with his donation of camera and film, allowed the movement to provide images of the rallies and sit-ins to major newspapers all across the globe. He also organized a Manhattan Gallery show of that work. Richard Avedon knew he was powerful in the industry, and he used this power when he could to push magazines to open up, at least a little bit. In 1959, Avedon photographed the Chinese-Portuguese-American fashion model China Machado for Bazaar. When the magazine's publisher told him they couldn't publish images of non-white models, Avedon threatened to leave Bazaar. The magazine backed down and the pictures were published. When he guest edited Bazaar in April 1965, Avedon included images of the first African-American model to appear in that magazine, Danielle Luna. 
publishers pulled their ads in response, and the magazine's publisher, William Randolph Hearst Jr., was enraged. As Avedon explained, he was never again able to shoot a fashion editorial starring Luna due to racial prejudice and the economics of the fashion business. In 1967, working on a Coke campaign, Avedon forced McCann Erickson, the powerful ad agency, to accept an African-American as the star of the ad. Unfortunately, though, not everyone had the clout and conscience of Avedon. True change in fashion still has a very long way to go. But let's just say that the fashion world has made some progress. For example, I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say that the powers to be of the 1960s could probably never have imagined that a young man like Olivier Roustang would someday be heading up a historic Parisian house like Belmont. Okay, so even though this was by far our very longest episode, we could have continued for hours on this topic. Susanna and Lynn often mentioned to us that they felt like they were just scratching the surface as they spoke about each image, model, and photographer. There's just so much to tell. This would be definitely be a great subject for its own series of podcasts. Our next Letteria Balmain episodes will bring the House of Balmain up to the present era. We'll be concentrating on the designs of the house's creative director, Olivier Rustong. As Rustong celebrates a decade overseeing the many collections of Balmain, he'll be sitting down with us to talk about what he feels were the key moments, collections, and campaigns that he's overseen over the past 10 years. Olivier Rustong was just 25 years old when he was named head of this historic house in 2011. He was clearly an unexpected choice. And that unexpected choice has helped push Balmain and fashion in unexpected directions. I hope you can join us. <laughs>